I thought we were talking about masculinity. We are. No, we're not. Yes, we are. What? How are we talking about masculinity? Because I'm asking you what you think of men and of women. Isn't no, that... basically what you've been trying to do, I would say for the last 15 minutes, is put me into a sequence of corners by accusing me of various forms of misbehavior. Do you think a trans woman is a real woman? <laughs> I don't really like the way those questions are formulated. You know, I don't know what that means. What do you mean a real woman? Well, she I'm asking you, in your mind, you know, it depends what you think a real woman is, but do you think a trans woman is a woman? No. Why not? Because I think that women are capable, generally speaking, of having babies and they have female genitalia and they have an XX chromosome and, and I think the biological markers are relevant. It doesn't necessarily mean that I don't think that people should be treated with respect and dignity if they happen not to fit easily into a gender category. That's a different issue. Right. But, but it's a matter of definition. And, and I actually think it's a foolish argument in some sense. Because what do you mean by real? Well, I mean, you've just clarified that, though. You, you, you don't think um, that a trans woman is a woman. And do you, do you think that that is what is behind or explains your opposition to this idea of a law mandating you to use a no. preferred pronoun is because you don't actually believe that that's the truth, that a trans woman is a woman and therefore you can't use that pronoun? No, that's not my argument at really? all. Really? Yeah, really. My yeah, argument is that the no, government should compel is. voluntary speech. No, but I know what your argument is. And no, you've but made that's it very really clearly. It. But, no, but behind, that's exactly it. There's but the no motivation behind, behind, no motivation it. behind it. But you don't believe it. I wouldn't put everything on my online in my life to take the stance I did unless I had thought that through very deeply. And I've thought it through very deeply. There aren't hidden motivations that have to do with some arbitrary prejudice against trans people. Okay. It's purely, pure and simply this. There's never been a time in English common law history where the government compelled speech and the Canadian government dared to do that. And that was unacceptable. And they masked it with this show of, of compassion for the oppressed and I don't buy it. Marxists say, well, that wasn't real Marxism. What it really means, and I've thought about this for a long time, it's the most arrogant possible statement anyone could ever make. It means if I would have been in Stalin's position, I would have ushered in the damn utopia instead, instead of the genocidal massacres because I understand the doctrine of Marxism and everything about me is good. It's like, well, think again, sunshine. You don't understand it. You don't understand it. And you're not that good. And if the power was in your hands, assuming you had the competence, which you don't, you wouldn't have done any better. And even if you had, there would have been someone else waiting right behind you to shoot you the first time you actually tried to do anything good. And that's what happened to all the old guard who ran the damn revolution. Stalin rounded them all up and shot them, along with their families and millions of other people. So even if you do happen to be that avatar of moral purity that you claim implicitly, the probability that you'd get to act out your goodness in relationship to those possessed by your ideology is zero. Those are the sorts of problems that trans people face every day, being out of housing, being considered, you know, considering suicide. These are really big problems. My, and my refusal to, prono to use pronouns because left-wing activists want me to use them has nothing to do with whether or not trans people are having difficulties in society. And I'd also like to point out that I've had many well, letters of support. Problem, isn't it? I've had many letters of support from trans people. And, and they tell me that the trans... Uh, the trans activists don't support them, and most trans people Jordan, actually wanted to be referred to as he or she. Doesn't mean they that weren't you my are friends. Untransphobic. They just weren't my friends. Just because you know a few people, just because you've talked they, to a few trans them. people, you you don't know the trans community like the trans community does. You've got no idea no, what it's like. The trans, to be trans. Professor, let's, trans, let's, let's, Professor Peterson. I'm sorry to interrupt. Let's yeah. let's uh, let Professor Peterson finish his thought, please. All right. So, the the trans activists aren't. Um, aren't proper representatives of the trans community because they haven't been elected by the trans community. They're, Nobody elected they're noisy. you either, Jordan. I'm not speaking for anyone except myself and on behalf of other people perhaps who want, to use, who want to maintain the right to free speech. I'm not claiming that I'm a representative of white people or white men or any other group. I'm speaking on behalf of myself. 
And so I'm not taking... But I'm Professor, not P Professor Peterson, let me jump in there, though, because we have seen an evolution of language. There are words that we don't use not anymore. Not by legislation. Describe, well, uh, legislation or not, there are words that have evolved. We don't use, for example, I'm Asian. I would bristle if someone called me Oriental. That is an evolution of, of how we use words. How is this different, whether legislated or not? I just said how it was different. I, I understand legislation is, I, is I how understand, it's different. I understand legislatively, but if at the heart of it is to allow a student to study f free of what they feel is discrimination, why not help that along? I already made my, my case for why not help that along. I believe that this legislation is extraordinarily dangerous. And there's other elements of it too that we haven't even got to in our society yet, like the protection for gender expression. And I've looked at gender expression in the Ontario Human Rights Code. And as far as I can tell, gender expression is best summarized in, in a single word, fashion. When people talk about common ground, it's got to be founded on some kind of truth. And when we have feminists saying, I don't believe in the biological differences between women, w men and women, well, that, that's why it's controversial. Where do you go from there? That's why it's controversial to say what you're saying, and it's, it's controversial to say, hold on a second, maybe uh, a girl on testosterone well, therapy winning high school wrestling meets is a problem. That's controversial. Yeah, maybe that's a bad idea. It's just possible that that's not a very good idea. You know, I mean, it's hard to imagine that that could be the case. But, well, in this idea that I don't believe in the biological differences between men and women, it's like, well, what do you mean by believe? <laughs> exactly. It's like, you act? You act out your belief. It's you true. know, I mean, what, what the hell does that mean? And, and what do you mean? See, what do you mean by belief? What do you mean by biology? And what do you mean by gender? Like, as soon as you put those three co concepts together in a sentence that says, I don't believe in the biological difference between the genders, you throw the meaning of all three of those words up into the air so far that no one can tell what you're talking about, including you. Yeah. And that's the goal, though, I think, a lot of the time. I think it's... Pretty oh, definitely. Definitely. The goal, part of the goal is an all-out assault on the categorical structure. The Ministry of Women's Affairs in New Zealand and the Minister of Women's Affairs, or the Minister for Women, as she's known, suggested recently that there were too many white old men on boards in New Zealand of private and public companies and just suggested that they needed to move aside so there could be more diversity. Your response to that suggestion? Well, um, what, what's her racial and ethnic background, just out of curiosity? I, I think uh, she's born in America, Julianne Genta. Um, she's a member of our Green Party here. Is she white? Yes. Well, maybe it's time for her to bloody well move aside and let someone who isn't white have her position. That's pure narcissism at work, by the way. <laughs> you know, to hijack, a, to hijack an event like this that other people put time and effort into and to use the, their, their civility of the crowd and the civility of the organizers as an excuse to blatantly yell out your ill-informed opinions is no way to conduct a civil dialogue. It's absolutely appalling. The people who do that should be embarrassed. I mean, and I've spoken with no shortage of trans people, and, you know, my proclivity has been without exception so far to address them in the manner that seems most socially appropriate under the circumstances. Now, you asked, I mean, you know, you asked a specific question, which was, do I have special expertise that I might share with, with other people? you're doing Martin Luther, and I think that these issues are a little subtler than those. And so, well, I'm what just makes waiting. you what makes you think that you're doing the kids that are grandstanding any favors by going along with their manipulation? Because I can't decide which ones those are. Well, I just then, have my gut instincts, well, and that's not good enough. Look, fair enough, but you have a type one and type two error problem. So one error is that you don't call students what they deserve to be called. That's one error. And the other error is that you, you call students what they want to be called even though they don't deserve it. And so what you're trying to do, optimally, is to minimize both those errors. And to do that, you have to take a middle route. 
Now, what you've decided to do, and I'm not criticizing it, is you've decided to allow for the possibility 100% of one of those errors because you think it's a less significant error. And, you know, you might be right. But it's not like you're acting in an error-free manner. You've just decided to minimize one form of error at the expense of the other. Because I would say you're allowing, uh, what would you call it, attention-seeking and somewhat narcissistic undergraduates to gain the upper hand over you in your class. You said that the problem with those angry women is that since at the end of the argument you cannot fight physically, you can't really deal with them. <laughs> That's not what I said. I said that that's one of the things that keeps conversation between men civil. Women can't argue with angry women. Women are often bullied by angry women. What I meant was more, uh, you, uh, you, you, you said that, and I'm really like not trying to paraphrase you or you know, to put words into your mouth. Uh, you, you, you actually you are trying that no, directly. No, it is things that you said, that you cannot deal with uh, those Yes, uh, but don't crazy tell me that you're not trying to put they're words into my mouth because you've this. selected well, what you're going to ask, and you selected it very carefully with a tremendous amount of forethought. Well, I, no, and I, there's a purpose for that. What is the purpose precisely? I, I am quoting things that you said. Why? Because, what is it that because, you're trying because, to establish? Because you said that. I'm I thought we were talking about masculinity. We are. No, we're not. Yes, we are. What? How are we talking about masculinity? Because I'm asking you what you think of men and of women. Isn't no, that... basically what you've been trying to do, I would say, for the last 15 minutes is put me into a sequence of corners by accusing me of various forms of misbehavior. So the, why are we the, doing that? The, What's the point here? These are things that you said. Uh, my That's job my as a journalist is to ask questions about what you represent and the ideas that you defend. Your, your job is also to select the things that you might ask about in some manner that doesn't indicate a substantive bias. You picked three things to talk to me about in the last 20 minutes that were very carefully selected. Like, why did you pick those things? Because this is my job. No, not necessarily. You could be asking me, for example, why I've spoken to 250,000 people live in the last eight months. That might be more newsworthy. Well, we're not going to have a, a big debate about journalism, but uh, if a journalist doesn't ask the tough questions, how can you give the good answers? Well, it depends on what the tough questions are. It depends well, on the I didn't way, think whether that they would be tough. We're talking about things that you said. I mean, if it's easier to have conversation between men, because there is this underlying threat, you know, of a uh, physical uh, contact. I don't think it's it, easier. Mm. It tends to be somewhat more civil. Pronoun misuse may become actionable through the human rights tribunals and the courts. And the remedies? Monetary damages, non-financial remedies, for example, ceasing the discriminatory practice or reinstatement to the job, and public interest remedies, for example, changing hiring practices or developing non-discriminatory policies and procedures, jail time is not one of them. Jordan, you're not going to go to jail if you keep this up. Are you, do you find that uh, reassuring? What if I don't pay the fine? Then what? Can someone please explain to Jordan B. Peterson that there's a difference between freedom of speech and freedom from consequence? Do you agree there's a difference? Well, certainly there's a difference. And are you prepared to suffer the consequences that society may deem you need to suffer because of your views? I'm, yes, I'm prepared to do that. What so, does that entail? Are you open to learning? Well, hang That's on. That's not H the question. Hang on, that, that wasn't the question. It's That's true. Right. Well, so what am I willing to do? Uh, well, know. I think that the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal is probably obligated by their own tangled web to, to bring me in front of it. If they find me, I won't pay it. If they put me in jail, I'll go on a hunger strike. I'm you not doing this. And that's that. Mm -hmm. I'm not using the wor words that other people require me to use, especially if they're made up by radical left-wing ideologues. Now, if our society comes to some sort of consensus over the next while about how we'll solve the pronoun problem, let's call it, and that becomes part of popular parlance, and it seems to solve the problem properly without sacrificing the distinction between singular and plural, and without requiring me to memorize an impossible list of an indefinite number of pronouns, then I would be willing to reconsider my position. But I'm also partly um, opposed to this because it's been made mandatory and has the whole weight of the law behind it. It's like, this is a very bad idea. I believe this is a very bad idea. And I believe that the reason this has caused so much noise, tremendous amount of noise, tremendous amount of attention on YouTube, is because there are things that, that are at stake in this discussion, despite its surface nature, that's, that, that strike at the very heart of our civilization.
uh, question uh, for Professor Peterson. Um, why do you feel that someone's personal gender identity and pronouns infringes your free speech? Can one not also argue based on your interpretation that professors can use racial slurs in their classroom um, and the, that the inability to do so would violate their freedom of speech? There's a difference between saying that there's something you can't say and saying that there are things that you have to say. And I regard these made up pronouns, all of them, as the neologisms of radical PC authoritarians. Do you understand that? And I don't, I'm not a fan of that sort of person. And the reason I'm not a fan of that sort of person is because I've done my homework. I've read everything I can get my hands on in the development of authoritarian political systems, and I know the literature inside out and backwards. And I am not going to be a mouthpiece for language that I detest. And that's that. As you might imagine, you've been a topic of conversation on this campus a lot in the past week or so, certainly among a lot of us who discuss politics. And one of the things that sort of united people who like and dislike a lot of your ideas is that we appreciate your defense of free speech, and we appreciate you coming here to talk about it with us. Uh, but one of the things I thought was really interesting is Professor Van Dyke addressed the distinction between you and Jonathan Haidt. And you mentioned this as sort of a temperamental one. And I think, I'm, I'm sure that's true to some extent, but I, I noticed you've, you've made a lot of more sort of substantively inflammatory claims. Like in the course of this lecture, you called uh, pe the authors of Facebook posts demons and totalitarians. Uh, in past events, you've called them things like uh, neo-Marxists, cultural Marxists. Uh, you've called them, a, I believe, a fifth column that is committing treason against the West. And it seems to me this is more than temperamental. This is a substantive difference. And, and it's another, a substantive yes, difference, and, yes. And another thing you've done is that unlike height, you have a more sort of comprehensive political program. You've talked a lot in defense of traditional hierarchies, both of gender, of class, so on, uh, though emphatically not of race. Uh, and so it seems that I haven't talked about defense of traditional hierarchies in terms of gender and class. That's not true. Well, you've talked about hierarchies in society. You've talked yeah, about Yeah, that's yes. true. I well, have done that. Not but that I haven't class? justified them on the basis of gender and class. You, or, you or whatever it is. Well, okay, but you, you talk not about, okay. That's an important yes, distinction. Okay, but you, you defend hierarchies in society in a way that you talk a lot about the Pareto distribution, yes? That doesn't mean I yeah. defend it. Well, okay. You, you, no, not well, yes. okay. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, I think you talk Observing a lot. Observing that something exists is yes. not the same as defending it. How in the world? Well, people attack it, right? What's that? And you don't. People attack it. Attack as inherently what? Attack the hierarchies of society as inherently unjust, right? Well, they are, they're unjust, but yes. they're also useful. Okay, so you, you, def you say they're useful. Some well, look, people look, look at it this way. Okay, look at it this way. You obviously think that it's worthwhile to stand up and ask a question. Yes. So you think that standing up and asking a question is better than yes. not standing up and asking a question. Yes. Okay, that's a hierarchy. Yes. Of values. Yes. Okay, without the hierarchy of values, you couldn't act. Of course. No, no, not of course. Well, wait. It's you, partly why I, I'm defending the hierarchy. Here. Without no a hierarchy, there's no the impetus facts to of act. The hierarchy, right? What's that? There is a hierarchy in society, right? No, there's multiple hierarchies in society. Okay, there are multiple society. hierarchies in society, right? Yes. And you say that they are based in, you, you invoke the lobster, right? That they are based in, uh, in nature. Yes. I said that they were inevitable. Yes, yes. that they were inevitable. Some right. people that disagree with that. That doesn't mean that they're but, good. But my point is that, uh, this is generally relevant to it, you have a broader point than free speech. This is one of the things you talk about, yes? Yes. Okay. Whereas I think there are some other activists who focus on more exclusively I'm not an speech. activist. I would say that anybody with more than a cursory knowledge of 20th century history who dares to claim simultaneously that they have compassion for the downtrodden and that they're Marxists are revealing either their an ignorance of history that's so astounding that it's actually a form of miracle or a kind of... <laughs> Or a kind of malevolence that's so reprehensible that it's almost unspeakable. Because we already ran the equity experiment over the course of the 20th century, and we already know what the, the Marxist doctrines have done for oppressed people all around the world. And the answer to that mostly was imprison them, enslave them, work them to death, or execute them. And as far as I can tell, that's not precisely commensurate with any message of compassion. Sorry, tried that, didn't work. We've got 100 million corpses to prove it, and that's plenty for me. And if it's not enough for you, well, then you should do some serious thinking either about your historical knowledge or about your moral character. Need a question? Yes. Okay. okay. I mean, My like I said, is, you're doing fine, do you but think, it's just too yes. much. Like, I can't keep it do straight. Do you think that 
your behavior risks politicizing it, and do you think that politicization is justified? I think my behavior risks politicizing it, yes. I would rather it not be politicized, and I'm doing what I can to manage that risk. However, it's become political in my country because the government implemented compelled speech legislation. So I wasn't complaining about that before it became political. Now, and there, are, there is a time, even when you're detached in some sense from the political realm, that you can't be detached anymore. Well, I'm not happy with the fact that this has become politicized. You could say that I haven't done a stellar job in ensuring in every possible manner that this has remained neutrally apolitical. Probably true, you know, but I'm not particularly unhappy with the way things have gone so far. So, and I'm not happy with the radical left. And so, if they're irritated at me, so much the better, as far as I'm concerned. So, have I conducted myself perfectly? It's like, uh, undoubtedly no. So, um, I'm, I've got more than my fair share of faults, and a temper is one of them. But um, I'm muddling through. Look, look at it this way. All right. Women are much more likely to try to commit suicide. And men are much more likely to kill themselves. And the reason for that is that men use lethal force and women don't. Now, that's a big difference. Okay, so then you say, well, women manifest aggression towards themselves and to others, but they don't use lethal force. They don't use physical force the same way men do. So they have to do it some other way. Why do well, they have the other to ways? do something some other way? That, you're right, because you can people take are your aggressive. Hobbesian war against... You know, so you're basically a Hobbesian. Like, uh, no, war I'm half and against half. War. Half and half. Half Hobbes, half Rousseau. That's why I'm not an ideologue. Because I don't think that people are good or evil. I think they're both. I don't think that culture is security or tyranny. I think it's both. And I don't think that nature is benevolence or catastrophe. I think it's both. And that's why I'm not an ideologue. Well, it's not, it's not an essentially bad idea. It's a terrible to challenge, idea. Challenge the tyranny the, of the patriarchy and the West. It is an absolutely terrible idea when you assume that the fundamental reality of the West is patriarchal tyranny. It's like compared to what exactly? Our societies are more free and more productive than any other societies in the world and than any other societies that have ever existed. Now, that doesn't mean they're without their faults. No, but if you look and you say, look at the facts and you look at who's in power. And who and is who in has power exactly? And what, what exactly do you mean by that? The, let's say Political men. Political power. Mainly men. It depends on the domain. It's certainly not the case in, in, in anything that has to do with the provision of health. It's not the case in education. No, but say political power. At say the very upper Mr. echelons. Trump. Yes. Yes, at the very upper echelons, yeah. polit polit politics are dominated by I mean, men. What's the point? Does that make it world, a patriarchal yeah. tyranny? Well, it certainly makes it patriarchal to a certain extent. Well, and so when women participate in that patriarchal process, is that also a patriarchy? So when we have healthcare system that's dominated by women, as we do now, is that a patriarchy? No. Why not? I wouldn't call it a patriarchy. Because, because it doesn't because involve a, men. Yeah. Isn't it the structure that's patriarchal or is it the gender okay. that makes the difference? Clearly you think it's the structure? No, I don't buy the whole patriarchy idea or the tyranny idea. I think it's, I think it's absolutely appalling. The idea that we have a hierarchical structure in the West is true. The idea that hierarchies tend towards corruption and deception and stultification across time is true. It's certainly the case that we need to be awake and criticize our institutions, but that is not the same thing as calling the West a patriarchal, ty patriarchal tyranny. And words matter, especially among academics who should be very, very careful with their words.